Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Visit Day CAM Colloquium. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Townsend as today's uh, CAM Colloquium speaker. So uh, Alex is one of our own, uh, which I, I'm very happy about. I first met Alex in April of 2014. Um, when he was still, when he was finishing off his uh, DPhil at Oxford, uh, and I was visiting Nick Trefethen, um, and I sort of kept an eye on his career since, and was very delighted when we were able to attract him to Cornell, um, and uh, subsequently we got uh, my colleagues Anil and Austin, and so leaving me as the uh, sole example in our group of uh, the potential of a numerical analyst at Cornell whose name does not start with A. Um, but uh, Alex, is, uh, Alex works on a wide variety of stuff. Um, so I know him originally from his work on approximation theory, um, particularly with uh, Chebyshev polynomials and rational functions, but also with interest in special functions. Uh, but he really is, is much broader than that, uh, working widely in numerical linear algebra, in spectral methods for PDEs, low rank techniques, fast transforms, um, and has moved a little bit into things like theory of deep learning more recently. Um, and today he's going to be talking about work that's uh, done jointly with uh, some, some other wonderful colleagues from math, uh, Mike Stillman and Steve Strogatz. Um, on uh, dense networks that synchronize and sparse ones that don't. Uh, a couple of logistical housekeeping items. Um, this talk is being recorded uh, and will be put up on the web with the uh, beginning and end uh, uh, nonsense trimmed off uh, at some point. Um, do keep your microphones muted, but uh, feel free to leave the video on uh, as I see a number of you are already doing. Um, and if you want to ask a question during the presentation, um, you can use the hand raise function. Uh, and uh, when there's a pause, I will uh, pester Alex and say, um, there is a question in the chat and, and let you uh, say your bit. And with that, Alex, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, David. Thank you for reminding me when we first uh, met. It was a, a nice introduction. So, so today I want to talk about a, a, a little research project that I, I've been doing with uh, the Master of Computational Algebraic Geometry, uh, Mike Stillman, and the Master of Dynamical Systems, uh, Stephen Strogatz. And um, I thought it was a, it's going to be a, hopefully a fun and entertaining um, a Zoom talk. Um, and along the way, I hope to give the prospective graduate students uh, a little tidbits of advice on um, on research and grad school. So the first tidbit of advice is to work with great people and uh, with Mike and uh, Stephen here, that, that's definitely true of this project. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the way this project started actually was uh, every week or every other week, uh, Steve and I, sometimes joined by Alex Vladimirsky, we would wander down <laughs> and have lunch together, sometimes in the physics building and sometimes in this uh, wonderful hall called Risley Hall, which is on campus. And the reason I like this place is it reminds me the most of uh, England. Uh, and um, eating here is, is a, as we chat about mathematics, is a lot of fun. So <clears throat> uh, I guess the second tip bit there is like, don't do mathematics hungry. <laughs> so today I want to talk about uh, synchronization. So synchronization is this per pervasive phenomena in, in nature uh, where oscillators uh, fall into sync. So here, I, there's a video of uh, fireflies in Thailand. And these fireflies, to attract mates, they, they have a tail that, that flashes in the dark. And what you can see here, even though there is no um, uh, orchestra, there's nobody uh, ordering these flies to go into sync, they instill it flashing in unison. And so there's a question here of how do these fireflies manage to flash with such unity? Um, without uh, being led by a, a global leader. Uh, this is also true not just for fireflies, uh, it's also true for uh, neurons in the brain. So here is a, a mice brain uh, where they've uh, put a dye in 
in the brain so that every time a neuron fires and there's a calcium concentration, uh, you get to see it visually with light. And so here you can see that these neurons are firing and when they fire, they kind of all fire in unison. And um, so there's just a question, a mathematical question as well as a biological question now, of can we understand how these uh, objects are sinking? Okay, to get this into some mathematics so we can actually study, we're going to treat every firefly or neuron as an oscillator. So, and I'm gonna color code them. So I'm gonna write down a function uh, theta i, uh, which depends on time, which is uh, a function that keeps the phase of the, of the oscillator. So you could imagine when this goes around one time, that's like a, a firefly flashing. And I, I've color coded them so that um, red is at phase zero, and as we go around the rainbow, uh, as theta goes around, we, we color the oscillator with a rainbow. Now, so these oscillators are not just uh, all by themselves. They are connected. We are imagining that they have some connections, like neurons in a brain have some synapses being connected to them. And fireflies might know about their neighbors or be watching their neighbors. So to, to get that into mathematics, we're going to think of these oscillators on graphs, where the fireflies are vertices. An edge, an edge between two vertices, between two fireflies, uh, corresponds to uh, one firefly watching the other. So here is a, an example where I've started these fireflies off all uh, without sinking. They're all in, start off with arbitrary phase. And because of the, the topology of this graph, which I will explain in this talk, you can see uh, that they eventually start uh, sinking and flashing in unison. So this is the kind of uh, situation that we're using to model these, uh, these uh, things that happen in nature to try to explain synchronization. Okay, so um, it's really important in this, in this tone of subject to start simple, because even this uh, very simple model here is actually surprisingly hard to understand. So uh, remember that theta i is the phase of the ith oscillator at some given time, right? So theta i is the i oscillator. And I'm gonna um, assume that that oscillator wants to beat at a particular natural frequency, which I've called omega. So I'm assuming all of the oscillators are identical. They all want to beat at the same uh, frequency, uh, omega. Uh, we also need to have something in this uh, model about the graph. So aij, is the adjacency matrix of the graph. So Aij is one if I is watching J and J is watching I and zero otherwise. So what do I mean by watching? I mean that there's this coupling term in this dynamical system uh, called, uh, that's uh, the simplest one to get this behavior is a sign. So what does this mean? You can imagine, let's say theta I is um, running ahead, is ahead of theta J then this, this term here will be negative because I, theta i is above is ahead of theta j. So uh, the sign will be negative and this will be pulling theta i back towards theta j. Similarly, if theta i is running behind theta j, this will be positive and this will give it a bump and try to increase uh, theta j because this is the gradient. So this is the dynamical system that uh, we're using to study this behavior, of course, um, right, the, mo the most important thing here for this sign, it's, it's odd, it's an odd function that's uh, periodic, two pi periodic, because the phase is two pi periodic. Okay, so this is what I'm running when I, when I run these uh, simulations. So here's what it looks like on a random graph. This happens to be an Erdos Reni graph. There are 50 oscillators. Uh, two oscillators are connected with probability uh, 0.1. Here's a particular, so this is where they fall into sync. You can also have quite dense uh, graphs that don't fall into sync. So here, this is a, 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 what we call a Mexican wave, because it's like a thing at a stadium where everyone's lifting up their hands and putting them down, uh, where the, you can just see this uh, waves uh, cycling around this graph. And this is, a, this is also stable in this case. And if the fireflies in this graph for this model were set up with these phases, they, would, they wouldn't fall into sync. They would, they would continue in this Mexican wave-like pattern. 
So we know that there are dense matrices, dense graphs, sorry, out there that uh, fall into sync. Um, there are dense graphs out there that don't appear to fall into sync always. And there's sparse ones that um, do and don't. So we're trying to find like, what's the important topologies of the graph that uh, mean the graph always falls into sync or the graph um, may not. So that's what we're trying to investigate with this simple model. So the, the tidbit here for, for perspective graduates like start simple and the rest of this talk is about following your curiosity. So uh, to make that more precise, I'm just gonna give a word to uh, what we mean. So we, we say a graph is globally synchronizing. If in the long run, so if I wait long enough, all the oscillators on that graph fall into sync, uh, starting from all initial conditions, except maybe a set of measure zero. So if I start them all at random phase, uh, a globally synchronizing graph, all the oscillators will eventually beat in unison. Now, you might wonder, or just in intuitively, you might think that dense graphs have a really good chance of always falling into sync because there are uh, two fireflies, or what one firefly knows a lot about its neighbors if the graph is dense. Whereas you also might expect sparse graphs might have trouble being globally synchronizing because uh, not uh, a firefly doesn't know so much about all its neighbors. So the questions that uh, the literature tries to answer here are, uh, or one question we might ask is, what's the sparsest graph? that globally synchronizes, right? A sparse graph that globally synchronizes, that should be a surprise because there's not so much connectivity in the graph and yet it always falls into sync. Uh, or another question which has actually received a lot of attention is what's the densest graph that doesn't globally synchronize? So if you can find a very dense graph that doesn't globally synchronize, you should be surprised because the fireflies know a lot about their neighbors, but yet, there's still a configuration where they do not fall into sync, into unison. Right? Remember, there's this coupling between fireflies uh, based on that sign term. There's a sign coupling between connected fireflies. Okay, so I'm just going to pause to stop and see if there are any questions, as well as a way to encourage questions. Um, so if there's any questions. Alex, I, I, I'd like to ask, ask a couple questions. Yep. Um, the first one is, are there examples of graphs where there's a positive measure set of initial conditions that does synchronize and a positive measure set that does not? Positive set that uh, does and does not. Positive, um, set of, positive measure set of initial conditions that lead to synchronization and another positive measure set of initial conditions that don't. Uh, I don't know for, for sure off the top of my head, but my expectation is yes, there probably is such graphs. <laughs> um, I, I can look into that, but I haven't, yeah, that's not, it's kind of uh, in the middle, that would be it. That's an interesting set of graphs to look at. And my second question, it, it's not obvious to me from the setup yeah. that the uh, distinction between globally synchronized graphs and those that don't globally synchronize would be independent of the choice of omega. Oh, I'm, about, I'm about to do that. I'm about to show oh, Okay, you. great. Because, because they're all identical oscillators, uh, it actually is independent of omega. Okay, Lyndon? Um, are your graphs directed? Say that again? Are your graphs directed? No, my graphs are not directed. I'm assuming that if Firefly I is looking at Firefly J, then J is looking at I. Okay. There, of course, could be directed versions of this, but even this model, we don't fully understand. Um, Javier? Hi, um, I was gonna ask the same question uh, about the directed graphs, but I was also wondering at one point of, of the phase of theta, are you assuming that the, the light is on is that relevant? Uh, so, so yeah, you could pretend that the light turns on as the as theta, when theta is in a range close to zero. But um, here we're really just trying to ask, you know, what uh, in the long run do all those thetas end up at the same value? So that, that so do they all do they all be in unison? Do all the thetas end up being equal for all time in the long run? 
So, so you can translate that back to the, the setup of flashing if you think of a flash when the oscillator is red, for example. And Robin? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, clarify one point earlier. Do all of the fireflies have the same, uh, I guess, fundamental frequency? Do they all have the same omega and it's just the phase shifts that are from between them? Or are we also looking at fireflies that have uh, sort of different values of omega? Right, so there's the Kuromoto model where the, the, fire, the fireflies would start off with a random uh, natural frequency or a frequency in a range. Here, we're looking at the very simple version of that where all the oscillators have identical natural frequency. Okay, omega. thank you. So omega does not depend on I. That's a good point to clarify. So it's the absolutely simplest case you can take. And Bobby, do you have one more question or is it your hand up from before? That's an accident, I just left it up. Okay. okay. So uh, let's start by searching for the sparsest graph that globally synchronizes. So the, the reason there's not so much literature on this is the, uh, we found out the answer's not so interesting. But the first thing I need to do is going back to the, the point of, does it matter about the omega? So because the, the omega, the natural frequency is, is identical for all oscillators, instead of uh, looking at this, I can shift back in time and look at some other variables, which I'm calling theta hat i. So theta hat i is theta i minus uh, omega t. Omega t is the, the what I would expect and the beating of these uh, oscillators if there was no coupling. So I can extract off this and, and look at these theta hats. So these theta hats now, when, when I go into sync, if I went into global synchrony, they would end up being constants, right? Because I've taken off the natural frequency that they beat at. So, okay, maybe they're not all the same. Maybe they're uh, different by two pi, which, which is the same on a circle in the rainbow pattern. But I'm looking now for constants as opposed to things that are uh, changing linearly with omega. And so if you rewrite the uh, dynamical system just in terms of theta hats instead of thetas, then you get this dynamical system here, uh, showing you that it doesn't matter, like omega doesn't matter um, in this problem. So we can take it out. So uh, I will be looking at, when I say, you know, these fall into sync, I'll be looking at equilibrium uh, related to theta hat. But when I plot them to make it a pretty video, I'll be plotting the thetas so you can see the color rainbow uh, oscillating. Okay, so that's me taking off, making the model even simpler, right? Saying that you don't even, you can assume that the natural frequency is, is zero. Basically. Okay. So this in, from a dynamical point of view, this is this kind of a, uh, a mundane dynamical system because it's simple. There is no uh, attracting tori or limit cycles. Everything in the long run can be described by the equilibrium of this dynamical system. And that's because it's a gradient system. So everything's always uh, kind of falling downhill. So uh, nothing complicated happens. And all we can do is look at the equilibrium of this dynamical system to judge its long-term behavior. So uh, all these trajectories of these theta hats, they, they flow monotonically downhill to an equilibrium point. Um, so we can study the solutions to uh, the, the equilibrium equation where we put zero on the right-hand side. So the theta hats no longer change in time. They're constant. Um, uh, of course, to do this, you look at the, you have to look at the Jacobian and this is just a exercise that you can do to calculate the Jacobian of this uh, um, equilibrium point. Okay, so this is what we have to play with. We're looking for solutions to this and we can judge uh, the types of, uh, types of equilibrium we have by looking at the Jacobian. In particular, we know if we can clarify if these equilibrium points are stable or unstable saddle points by looking at the eigenvalues of this Jacobian. Okay. So uh, the sparsest graph. So the game is I, I give you some nodes or I give you some oscillators and you've got to connect them up so that they, uh, so that it's a globally synchronizing graph with as few edges as possible if you want to be sparse. So, okay, you go along and you start connecting. Of course, the graph has to be con um, connected. If the graph isn't connected, it's disconnected, they're not going to fall into sync because one half of the graph doesn't know about the other half. 
So it has to be connected. And I guess the surprise is that uh, as soon as you build a tree, so uh, kind of the sparsest connected graph here, any tree, uh, you will fall, it's a globally synchronizing graph. Um, it's actually relatively easy to show using some linear algebra techniques. So um, what equilibrium do you have? Well, if this guy is, if this guy is theta hat and it's, or this guy's theta hat and it's connected to its neighbor, the only thing to make that sign term zero is to make the difference between this purple oscillator and this one, uh, zero or pi, right? Or two pi or three pi. So these are the only equilibrium points of a tree. And by a simple calculation, you can show that that Jacobian matrix has positive eigenvalues by looking at this Rayleigh quotient thing. Okay, so this means that if I run a tree, okay, it's gonna take a while, <laughs> uh, but eventually those oscillators fall into sync. Um, they, they always fall into sync. This is a, a stable equilibrium and it's the only stable equilibrium. They're all in, all in phase uh, uh, situation. So the sparsest graphs that synchronize are just trees, right? which is the sparsest connected graph, basically, the fewest number of edges. Okay, but it's, it's a bit strange. If I, if I connected this up, right? Now, if I add one more edge, you might think that will encourage even more synchronization, but this actually is not a globally synchronizing graph. Now there's a cycle here and you can have a Mexican wave cycling around this cycle now. So edges aren't always good for you if you are trying to get synchronization. You can go further with this idea. This is a simple linear algebra idea to try to study uh, other graphs. So if I start with a graph and I append a, a tree, so in this case, I've just appended a single edge, you can kind of run through the same uh, linear algebra techniques, uh, looking at, well, this ed adding one edge and one node corresponds to a rank one update of this Jacobian matrix J. So, uh, you can study the, the eigenvalues um, of the Jacobian when you've appended on one extra node and uh, one edge. And you can show that, okay, adding and pruning trees uh, doesn't change the global synchrony of the graphs. So this means that if the original graph was globally synchrony, synchronizing and you add an edge, then the edge, uh, this thing is still globally synchronizing. Vice versa, if you have a graph with an appended edge like this and you cut it off, then the final graph uh, keeps the global synchrony of the uh, bigger graph. So global synchrony is not changed by appending a tree, appending an edge to your graph. So here, um, okay, so here this is a, a cycle that we know exists on a pentagon, a Mexican wave. And what you can see is that you can get this Mexican wave to still hold when you've appended an edge by making this oscillator just be exactly the same in terms of phase as its neighbor. And uh, so we, we exactly know what we need to do when we have trees or graphs with trees added. So this gives us a way to build bigger graphs from smaller ones. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the more mathematical interesting uh, direction and try to search for dense graphs that do not synchronize. Before I do that, I will stop for any more questions. So if there's questions, you can just unmute your mic. So dense graphs that don't globally synchronize is, is a surprise as well. Yep. Um, I'm wondering what, uh, how many ways are there for a graph to not synchronize? Is it, does it always do the Mexican wave or do you oh. sometimes see like more chaotic behavior? Uh, yeah, so later on in the talk, I'm going to show you some exotic versions of Mexican waves. I, you can be very complicated, and it doesn't have to be a Mexican wave. It can be Mexican waves uh, twinning together, exotic versions of these things. And uh, we don't know. I'm imagining you can get very exotic, uh, stable uh, equilibria. Okay. Uh, I'm also wondering, um, is it ever possible to get and equilibrium uh, where the graph synchronizes, but have it be an unstable equilibrium. It's just yeah. kind of a, a fascinating idea to me, the idea of a graph that's like synchronous, but if you touch it, then it falls apart. Yeah, yeah. so in that tree, in that tree case, uh, th there are many equilibria which correspond to unstable equilibrium, where the, the Jacobian has positive eigenvalues. So if you just perturb it by a little bit, it will fall out of that equilibrium. And what we showed there was that the only 
uh, the only um, stable uh, equilibrium is the all in phase. But actually that, that tree had two to the n minus one equilibria and all of them apart from one were stable. Now well, all of them apart from one were unstable. So yeah, that, that's common. Every okay. almost every graph will have tons of equilibrium. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Shreya. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sort of building on that, um, like, is there notions of partial synchrony? Uh, what What would you mean by partial synchrony? Like, some of the graph is in synchronization with one, like the oscillators are in sync, and the other are not. Like, it seemed like in that cycle, that tree that was yeah. appendant seemed to be some kind of synchrony there. Yeah. So in um, the Konamoto oscillators literature, there is a sense of like a, a partial synchrony. Uh, here, we're just looking at the pure case. So um, there, there, there is, I mean, everything is described by equilibria. So um, you could come up with some concept of partial, of partial synchrony, but we don't do that yet. Thank you. So there's one more question from David. Go ahead. Does every tree synchronize, every tree on end nodes? Okay. Every tree is a globally synchronizing graph. Mm -hmm. So we, we so if now I'm looking for dense graphs that don't synchronize, right? The other way, the other flip. So uh, a firefly knows a lot about all its neighbors and still we don't fall into sync. So um, back in 2006, there was graphs uh, like nearest neighbor graphs like this that we knew were relatively dense that didn't globally synchronize. So here, uh, every firefly knows um, knows about about sixty five percent of its neighbors. It has uh, information about its couple too. Yet the Mexican wave is a stable equilibrium for this graph. So this 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 cycle will go forever. And um, what there's been is there's been this try to understand like what how dense is dense enough to get global synchrony. So uh, in 1984, it was known that if you have the complete graph like every node is connected to every other node, then it for always for falls into sync. And then Taylor shaved off. So this is, means 90, 93% of, uh, so a node knows about 93% of its neighbors. And there's a, um, we know that if you go above that number, then you will definitely be globally synchronizing. So we also know now with slowly shaving off this number that if you're more than 79% connected, which means every node knows about 79% of its neighbors or more, the graph is guaranteed to be globally synchronizing. So the real question is, there's a 65 or 64 here that we with known examples that don't globally synchronize. But we know if we go above this number, we're definitely globally synchronizing. So what's the right critical density of a graph where you switch between uh, being globally synchronizing always to having examples where you don't have to, you don't globally synchronize. So it's really about trying to shave off these two numbers, one from above and one from below. So here's, here's this uh, result that we, we knew uh, from 2006. Uh, they're called uh, WSG graphs now uh, because of the authors. And these are, uh, every firefly is connected to its ALF nearest neighbors on a graph, on a cycle. And so, these, these are the graphs that support um, Mexican waves. And we know that if you take this sequence to the limit, uh, in this paper, they showed that 68%, uh, they have graphs that are 68% connected, and yet they do not fall into synchrony. Mexican wave is supported, the pattern of Mexican wave. So uh, this is where I came in, and we were, we were discussing this at Risley Hall, like what could we do? Can we really shave off these two numbers? So my first thing to do as a person who works in numerical analysis and linear algebra is to turn it into a linear algebra problem. So you can take here, you can take this and write it as a double angle formula, just write the sign as a double angle formula and end up um, rewriting it as a linear algebra problem. Here, this uh, C is a vector of cosines of your theta hat. S is the vector of sine theta hats and uh, this, dynamical system written in vectorized form is precisely this. I haven't actually changed, I haven't changed anything here. You can think of it, but this is the double angle formula, like cos theta, sine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cos theta. That's where this is coming from. 
And so now, once we've written it in terms of linear algebra, we can really start studying it from a linear algebra perspective where we have all our eigenvalue tools available. <clears throat> so uh, one set of family of graphs that I was very interested in uh, studying, that we we're very interested in studying, was circlant graphs. Circlant graphs are graphs that are constant on the diagonals and also have this cyclic structure, which means the second row is a copy of the first row but shifted to the right by one. So you can imagine taking this first row, shifting it to the right, the B1 that falls off the end gets wrapped around and comes to this entry here and you do the same. So each row is a circumshift of the row of, above it. And so uh, what we noticed is that all the examples in the literature that had found graphs that are not globally synchronizing were um, circling graphs, like cycles, complete graphs, WSG graphs, and more exotic versions. And so we, we said, okay, let's search for, uh, not search for dense graphs in this family where we can show that they're not globally synchronizing and improve, try to see if we can improve that lower bound on the critical density. What, the reason that we love circling graphs is we know everything about them. We know their eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are this, which is actually a coding of, the, of, a, twi of a Mexican wave, but there are P Mexican waves going around the cycle at any one time. So we know all the eigenvalues of this matrix. We know it's eigenvectors, they're cosines and sines, which is very convenient, which means that for these graphs, we know their equilibrium. We know, we know a lot of their equilibria, which are these twisted states, these Mexican waves with multiple twists. Right? So it's like a, a Mexican wave with more people with their hands up, all going around, around this cycle. So this is true for all circular graphs. All circular graphs, these are the equilibria, or these are a subset of equilibria. So if I take a cycle, this is a circular graph. I know that a one twist, a one Mexican wave is a stable equilibria on the, in this case. Uh, here's another uh, two twist Mexican wave that I started off at. And this is, a, uh, un, uh, this is another stable equilibria for this graph. Here's a four twist. This is where P equals four. And you can just see there's four Mexican waves kind of rolling around this graph. Moreover, for circling graphs, we know everything about their Jacobian. It turns out their Jacobian at all of these twisted states ends up also being circling. So we can actually analytically write down their eigenvalues. So this means we can study stability or not of every single twisted state for, for circling. So now, uh, what, I, what we did is we went away and we threw this on a computer and we just searched over all circling all uh, connected circling graphs for uh, n less than 50. And so this is what we found. We have upper bounds where we know if we go above this critical density, everything above here is definitely globally synchronizing. There's no point searching up here. We know what this means. Everything below that, below this upper bound, we, we don't know. And so we searched through all of them. And these are the densest ones for each n that we found. So here, for example, uh, for n equals five, we found the Mexican wave with n equals five is, is the densest possible graph of n equals five for circling that supports uh, a stable twisted state, stable twisted pattern. For n equals 16, it was this one, this was the winner. And our winner for, the, for between five and 50 was this graph here at n equals 44, which is a WSG graph, uh, the one that was found in 2006. Okay, so we were kind of disappointed because we didn't find a, uh, something that beat the current record in the literature. But we knew, we knew a way to bolster up these to bigger examples. So there's this idea of twinning where each oscillator kind of has children and the children follow their parents. So if I take this pentagon here and I let this oscillator have two children, and these two children follow precisely the same uh, phase as their parents, then we, we can, there's a theory which says, if this graph is supporting a Mexican wave or has a stable equilibrium, so does this one, where they go around in pairs, the children are following their parents. We, can, we don't have to have a node having just two children, we can have three, so that each triplet here is following its parent, or we can have 10. So all of these graphs have the same, like if one, if this is not globally synchronizing, neither is this one. But this is great because this process 
uh, increases the density of the graphs as we twin, the density goes up. So here the connectivity is that uh, two children or the children are connected as well as from their parent, as well as the children follow the connectivity of their parent. So these two are connected, but the, this one is also connected to these guys, these two, because this one was connected to this one. Same here, this one is connected to these two because it's following its parent in terms of connectivity as well as face. This is a way of building bigger graphs that are denser and still not globally synchronizing. So we can take our 50 examples as seeds for this twinning process. And we can get a bunch of graphs that none of these, none of these dots uh, correspond to graphs that globally synchronize. They all support patterns, uh, some Mexican waves, some two Mexican waves. And from this process, you can get a very dense graph right here is the densest winner right now. Uh, and that's point six, uh, six, eight, one, six, um, which is the, the, um, right, a good, a good, it's a pretty dense graph that doesn't globally synchronize. Um, other people have taken this process and done a little better, shaved off a bit. And we took the process and made it more complicated and shaved off a bit again, but it's kind of, uh, the processes are getting more and more complicated and we need new ideas uh, on, on to improve these lower bounds. We can't just keep twinning and adding and twinning. It's getting too complicated. But this is a, a good way to build very dense graphs that don't globally synchronize, which are surprising. So um, we got very excited by this because we nearly thought we had uh, the, the answer. <laughs> um, we originally thought that we had, so we found graphs that when we tried numerically, um, they looked like they were synchronizing. Like we had this, these, these very weird graphs that were 75% dense, and they seemed to be supporting uh, me complicated Mexican waves. Um, and we got tricked by the numerics when we were running these dynamical systems, because in most cases, the graph goes to sync or doesn't relatively quickly. It falls into an equilibrium very quickly. Whereas for these graphs, we happen to find when we were doing these computational searches, uh, we happen to find graphs that um, are kind of weakly unstable. So there's, we found initial conditions where the oscillators slowly leak away from that unstable equilibrium, but it's very slow. So here I'm showing you, like if we only perturb away from one of these unstable equilibria by 10 to the minus four, we have to wait 10 to the four seconds in, in our simulation before we, uh, we leave that state. So we kind of got tricked by this and we got very excited by 0.75, but found out later that um, they're from experiments that they're weakly, uh, nominally unstable. So that was a little disappointing, but it shows us that there's a complicated minefield of examples between that upper bound and that lower bound. It is a very, it's a very complicated minefield of graphs in between. So we're still searching for better lower bounds on this critical density. So while we were doing this, we found it super, very difficult to find graphs that were globally that um, that were not globally synchronizing. It seemed that every time we picked some random graph, it would globally synchronize. So we asked the question, you know, how common is global synchrony then? Uh, is it really? Do we really need to have the topology of this graph just right to make global synchrony? So the, this is where Mike Stillman got he very heavily involved because uh, another way to analyze the equilibria, uh, computationally at least, for uh, this dynamical system is to convert it to a polynomial system, right? So I can let SI be sine theta I, CJ be sine theta J, and I can write this dynamical system down as a set of a, a polynomial system of equations for which you can go to Mike Stillman and he can solve, as long as n is not too big, he can compute all the equilibrium from these. And then we can go away and go through each equilibrium and study its stability or not by looking at the Jacobian. So this gives us a way to analyze all small graphs, which hasn't been done before. So, uh, okay, here are all the connected non isomorphic graphs. Uh, with two, three, and four vertices. So many of these we know before you contact Mike Stillman, 
that they are, I guess this one's also a tree, but these guys are trees, right? So they're definitely globally synchronizing from our thing before. Uh, we know that if we prune a tree and we get it to a graph that we understand, like uh, in this case, a triangle, then uh, we also know that this one is um, globally synchronizing too from pruning argument, pruning a tree off, cutting a tree off. Um, <clears throat> we had to contact uh, uh, an expert on dynamical systems, Lee Deville, to think about this one. This one's an interesting case because the Jacobian is negative semi-definite, has four zero eigenvalues. So studying its stability or not is difficult. So this is another tidbit for <laughs> the prospective graduate students, like don't be afraid to ask experts for help. So, but anyway, Lederfeel eventually showed that this one is globally synchronizing. So that's not an interesting candidate, really. These are too dense from uh, the, the bounds. There's, these have more than 78% connectivity. So these are too dense to support patterns. So they always fall into global sync. And this one, we, we verified with Mike Stillman's software that this one is also globally synchronizing. So there are all the graphs uh, with four, four or fewer vertices are globally synchronizing for any, for any set of initial conditions apart from the set of measure zero. Okay, so that's not <laughs> much fun. So we go to n equals five. These are trees, these are prunes. You can prune them to stuff we understand. Uh, this one is from a Deville-like argument. You prune and then you, you apply this Deville argument. These are too dense to support patterns. And these we checked with uh, numerical uh, algebraic geometry tools. What's left is the stuff we already knew. It's a cycle of length five. And that supports, the only thing it supports is a Mexican wave. Uh, we know it only supports that because we, we did the calculation and compute all, this, all the equilibria and check them. Okay. So, you, okay, so that's not interesting either. Okay, let's go to n equals six, right? We just got to keep going until we find something interesting. So trees, pruning, Deville. So you prune and then apply Deville. So none of those can be globally synchronizing. Oh, they're, they're, sorry, all of those are globally synchronizing. These are too dense uh, to support pattern. And we checked all those by algebraic geometry. They ruled them out. All we're left is with three, three graphs that uh, are not globally synchronizing. These ones do support patterns. So what patterns do they support? Uh, this is a, uh, one of them is, is this one, which is a cycle of length six. It supports a Mexican wave. Okay, not that exciting. We knew about it. <laughs> um, this one is also not very exciting because it's a cycle of length five with a tree appended. We already knew that that was globally, that um, could support a pattern. So that was not globally synchronizing by making these two vertices just follow each other. Okay, this is the one where we got excited. And it goes back to the, the question of like, can you get more exotic things and still be stable? This is a, a, right, a, a pentagon with a, with a triangle attached to it. And there's, you can imagine like a, trying to have a Mexican wave supported on this triangle, as well as a Mexican wave supported on this, of this pentagon. And somehow they have to compete with each other to, to, if they want to sync up, right? And so here is a very strange, uh, stable equilibria for what we're calling an exotic Mexican wave. And uh, we, people didn't know that these kind of equilibria could exist before. And so we found this with numerical tools. <clears throat> um, right, so there's some weird uh, phase out of phase here for this equilibrium, but it's a nice, what we're calling exotic wave. Okay, still, you can now like, do the twinning and look at all those graphs that you might get as these are seeds and you don't find anything interesting, unfortunately. So we can continue search. Okay, so now we're on to uh, n equals seven <laughs> and Mike Stillman is currently doing this, but there are, there are 853 uh, non-isomorphic connected graphs of size seven. So, I mean, they're all here. <laughs> these are all of them. Uh, so I can go through them and do the trees, the pruning, and there's a lot, to, a lot for Mike Stillman to do yet. To, so I guess this is the final tip for uh, graduate, prospective graduate students. Sometimes in research, you just have to have a bit of gumption to keep things going. Um, <clears throat> so the hope is that as we continue to do these bigger and bigger searches, we eventually find a graph that uh, is a world leading graph in terms of its density uh, for being, for, so it's a very dense graph that supports a pattern. 
Each one of these can be used as a seed for the twinning process. So if any one of these is not self-synchronizing, we can make a sequence of denser graphs that are not globally synchronized. So that's uh, uh, kind of nice if we can find one. Um, and so we just got to keep going, getting it uh, more. OK, so this is my more uh, speculative slide. <laughs> because when we look, when we do these computer searches through all these graphs, um, one thing we can never do is form a random graph and hope it's not globally synchronizing. In all our experiments, every, every time we form a random graph that's connected, it seems to be um, globally synchronizing. To, for, we've, never, we've never found an example where that's not true. So there's a conjecture in the literature now, which is that all connected erdos reni graphs are, self, are globally synchronizing. So this means that as soon as you have an erdos reni graph that, where the probability of two vertices being connected is sufficiently high that the graph is connected with probability one, with high probability, sorry, then um, the odos reni graph, we believe, as n gets big, is uh, with high probability globally synchronizing. And that's a conjecture that's in the literature. And we, people are, uh, are looking at that right now to try to figure out um, if that's true. One thing that Mateo Diaz, who's a CAM student, uh, did when he got involved was say, okay, you guys have found the circling graphs are very convenient family of graphs to study. How about we just study the erdos reni conjecture in the case where the graphs, we restrict the graphs to be circling. So he, he assumed that we have basically an erdos reni circling graph. So we connect two edges up to up with probability uh, 0.1 say, but we, we make sure the graph has circling structure. And uh, he's, he's managed to show, you know, with just a very small connectivity um, with and very high probability, the um, the graphs uh, are globally synchronizing, at least for twisted states. So there's still a lot more to do here. Okay, so like um, we have these graphs here, and they always seem to fall into sync. These random graphs here. So like this one breaks up and then eventually falls into sync. So that that was that circular one. Now uh, why why do people get excited by this conjecture? Uh, again, this is very speculative. When you look at brains uh, from different creatures, uh, here I've plotted the number of neurons in the brain, so humans have a lot, right, and roundworms don't have too much, and you plot their density, which is roughly the number of edges, the number of connect the connectivity between the neurons, then this line here is the erdos reni limit, the erdos reni density that you would get uh, for connectivity. So any erdos reni graph above this is connected with high probability, anything below is not connected with high probability. So this is the erdos reni threshold. And it seems that many of these uh, brains in, in nature are keeping up with the erdos reni connectivity um, limit. So, uh, and there's some argument about maybe you need some kind of synchrony of neurons in a brain to make any kind of decisions or be a living creature. So this is why people get excited. And there's some partial results that um, got published in 2019. This is a fantastic paper on the subject. Okay, so I've told you the sparsest graphs, they're trees. I've told you the current world record for the densest graph that doesn't synchronize. And uh, I've told you that, you know, we believe synchrony is commonplace. We believe most graphs uh, are, global syn are globally synchronizing. But for some graphs, you can get very strange, stable equilibria. Um, <clears throat> and I've told you about these five little tips for grad school, which were, um, you know, work with great people. You don't want to do mathematics on an empty stomach. Um, so go to Risley Hall. Uh, start simple and follow your curiosity. And stacked here, we kept with a very simple model, and we haven't changed it yet. Um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to other people. And uh, the final one, maybe the most important, is have gumption. So thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. I see other people applauding. Um, 
I there's a there's a question in the chat which I will read and then I'll take uh, the the opportunity to ask one of my own and then Bobby is up first. So the question in the chat has to do with the previous slide before this one. Uh, so Mateo's result. And the, the question is why the error term in there involves a square root of n rather than an exponential. Yeah, um, it's maybe a weakness in the argument uh, that Mateo has. Maybe it is exponential. But also these graphs are not just the erdos freni graphs. They're the erdos freni with circle and structure. So, um, right, so that's just a, uh, an output of, our, of the potentially um, theoretical results that you could potentially strengthen. So yeah, it would be better if it was exponential. But uh, one over square root n is just at least showing you as n gets big with high probability, Erdos Reni. So it's a weaker result than what you might hope, Martin. And I'll, so I'll ask my, my question, which is uh, you, you answered about directed earlier. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in a different extension, which is have you considered the weighted case and you know, the reason for thinking about that is, okay, you can then you can then either, you know, differentiate or if you've got multiple eigenvalues that are small, let's do a Poisson series in order to try and get an estimate for how close you are to stability under changes to the uh, changes to the topology, which might allow you to make guesses at least about uh, yep. edges that you could add for some of these. It's a it's a it's a brilliant question. So. Right, so we have looked at we have looked at changing the weights on the edge, the edges. In particular, for this raises edge, why are we calling it the raises edge? If I let any of these weights on any one of the, on any of these edges be negative, and then the, these graphs are um, at least in computations they they go into sync. So really, we feel like this example here is super close to synchrony, even though they're very dense. Yet uh, we haven't managed to find a sequence of examples. That are this dense that don't globally sync that um, that don't globally synchronize. So our conjecture is that 0.75 is the right the right limit because of these examples and the fact that if you change one of the, a couple of the edges to negative, then these you can make these fall into. Oh, we believe that they end up being globally synchronizing. So that's a game we've been thinking of playing and we have played it. But we haven't played it to the extent of uh, you know go, trying all different graphs because we've been trying to stay as simple as possible and understanding this, which we still haven't achieved. Bobby, hi Alex. Hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, you, you, a lot of your research has been focused on circulant graphs, and I wonder if you have looked at all at graphs where the symmetry group is a product of cyclic groups instead of one cyclic group. Yeah, I have looked. I have looked at um, graphs with uh, products of cyclic groups, but I haven't done such an extensive computational search. So I know. I know with uh, some for some graphs where you have a product of a cyclic group, you can get exo you can get exotic Mexican waves, um, very much like that pentagon with a triangle. You can get like weird Mexican waves um, forming, and I've, I've seen those. But it would be kind of interesting to see if I can just do a computational search through uh, all those graphs. Yeah. Um, here I was focusing more on twinning to use those as seeds because that gains a lot in the density. Oops, sorry. Um, it gains a lot in the density of uh, the graphs by twinning. So yeah. But if you could use any one of those as seeds. So what we do know is that there is a sequence of non of, of graphs that don't synch synchronize, there must be an infinite sequence of them that get denser and denser because of twinning. So we know if you give me an example, I can bolster it up to a denser one that doesn't synchronize. So there must be this sequence that asymptotes to some number. Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Alex. Hi. Uh, so we see that the pentagon with triangle uh, has this weird Mexican wave. Uh, do we have the same for a square plus a square? And um, because I'm interested how the length of the cycles will, will change things. Yeah, okay. A square for a square is a funny one because uh, Deville 
from Deville's argument that that's a the cycle of length four is a very special case because the Jacobian ends up being uh, negative semi-definite with four eigenvalues, so it's, it's harder to study. But if you if you start picking bigger cycles, like one of length n and another one of length m, then uh, provided m and n are co-prime, I think you can get you can get uh, two Mexican waves forming on them. Yeah, so that, that's some, there's a kind of graphs you could study. I'm not sure if they're really the kinds of graphs you would want to study if you're looking for the densest examples, but still they're an interesting family of graphs to study. Yeah. So I, I have another question, which is uh, the, the graph that you're showing here is, uh, at least for me, sort of interestingly counterintuitive in that it's uh, yeah. it's it's very slow to to fall out of this partial equilibrium, despite the fact that mm -hmm. not only does it not only is it very dense, but it's also uh, it's also got sort of uh, uh, very strong algebraic connectivity, right? So I, I would expect that if you looked at the second eigenvalue of the graph Laplace and for that thing it's pretty big you've got no small yeah. cuts yeah. um do you have a feeling in general for sort of what the can, can you say anything more about uh sort of the the decay times or or you know the short time behavior for for things that you know, there's there's sort of an intuitive idea that if you've got uh, uh, low algebraic connectivity, you're probably going to take longer to to synchronize. Yeah. And you you had shown that earlier with the tree, right? Yeah. Which is kind of, but you've got these cases now where uh, that's you've still got slow synchronization despite having fairly high algebraic connectivity. So. You know, clearly there's more than sort of the the first thing that you would grasp for you know with with uh, you know spectral graph theory tools right so it's, it's it's very complicated because when you add an edge you can both uh, you might stabilize the equilibrium you have originally but you might create a bunch of other equilibria or destroy equilibria uh, willy-nilly so it's very hard to keep track of the thinking of denser means, you go into sync faster. I, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, the razor edge example is an example of that. And I um, I haven't really looked at how fast it goes into sync, but I do know that between this upper bound and these, these examples, there's a minefield of razor edge kind of examples. I mean, I plotted them once. They absolutely completely fill out this, this region here of a very tricky equilibrium with Jacobian that have multiple zero eigenvalues. So that, that's, that, that's what this gap is filled with. <laughs> so, where li like kind of like simple linear analysis isn't, isn't good enough. Steve. Hi, Alex, nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you have to worry at all about when you're integrating these graphs, you know, the dynamics, do you have to worry about numerical truncation, uh, kind of making a effective, I don't know, non-one, non-unity weighting? or equivalently thinking of it as a phase perturbation that comes in? Um, uh, okay, yeah, so, well, I always, so for these circulant, for these circulant graphs, I have a formula for the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. And I know, I know that, I know twisted states are all equilibrium points. So I've done that already analytically. So actually this computer search, though there's like tons of graphs here, that is very quick because I have a, an analytic formula that I can just test, is this positive or negative? For, um, for the other graphs where you don't have analytic knowledge of the equilibria or for, uh, then you have, I just run a dynamical system. and I, I run that with uh, like, uh, like basically ODE 45 or ODE 113 and uh, let some adaptive numerical uh, um, simulation, uh, in numerical integrator do it. Um, but you will have to worry about those kind of perturbations for, precisely um, this razor's edge example, for example. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Like this, that's why we did this plot here to see how, if, if how much I perturb 
has a pattern with how fast it goes out of sync. Because you would imagine that if it's a if it's about small numerical noise, rather than the uh, original starting point, you wouldn't get such a clean uh, picture that as you move away from the twisted state, the, the time taken to relieve sync is linear. Right. So this was kind of some evidence we were thinking that is actually fundamental about the graph, as opposed to some weird thing about our numerics. So, but of course, that's still we we don't we don't know because we 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 we're relying on computational experiments to see if this is globally synchronizing or not. Yeah. So once I once you get these experiments, the idea would be to try and uh, analytically study them um, to tr try to prove it with mathematical formulas. We actually have a proof in this case that um, these are not globally synchronizing. So not only do we know this, uh, we have proved that these are not globally synchronizing. Uh, these are, sorry, these are globally synchronizing. We have a proof of that now, so. so yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. So given that we're at time epsilon plus two minutes, uh, or, you know, at the, at the end point plus two minutes, um, let's, Thank Alex again, and then we can, those who want to continue to hang out and ask Alex questions can, uh, can join in.